Hello, Joycians. I am Ted Howell, and I'm going to be reading today from Chapter 2, Nestor, starting with line 289. That reminds me, Mr. Deasy said. You can do me a favor, Mr. Daedalus, with some of your literary friends. I have a letter here for the press. Sit down a moment. I have just to copy the end. He went to the desk near the window, pulled up his chair twice, and read off some words from the sheet on the drum of his typewriter. Sit down. Excuse me, he said over his shoulder. The dictates of common sense. Just a moment. He peered from under his shaggy brows at the manuscript by his elbow and, muttering, began to prod the stiff buttons of the keyboard slowly, sometimes blowing as he screwed up the drum to erase an error. Stephen seated himself noiselessly before the princely presence. Framed around the walls, images of vanished Horses stood in homage, their meek heads poised in the air. Lord Hastings repulsed, the Duke of Westminster shot over, the Duke of Beaufort's Ceylon, Prix de Paris, 1866. Elfin riders sat them, watchful of a sign. He saw their speeds, back in king's colors, and shouted with the shouts of vanished crowds. Full stop, Mr. Deasy bade his keys, but prompt ventilation of this all-important question where Cranley led me to get rich quick, hunting his winners among the mud-splashed brakes, amid the balls of bookies on their pitches and reek of the canteen over the motley sludge. Fair rebel, fair rebel, even money the favorite, ten to one the field. Dicers and thimble riggers, we hurried by after the hoofs, the vine caps and jackets, and past the meat-faced women, the butcher's bean, nuzzling thirstily her clove of orange. Shouts rang shrill from the boy's playfield and a whirring whistle. Again, a goal. I am among them, among their battling bodies in a medley, the joust of life. You mean that knock-kneed mother's darling who seems to be slightly cross-sick? Jousts. Time shocked rebounds. Shock by shock. Jousts. Slush, an uproar of battles, the frozen death spew of the slain, a shout of spear spikes baited with men's bloody guts. Now then, Mr. Deasy said, arising. He came to the table, pinning together his sheet. Stephen stood up. I have put the matter into a nutshell, Mr. Deasy said. It's about the foot and mouth disease. Just look through it. There can be no two opinions on the matter. May I trespass on your valuable space? That doctrine of laissez-faire, which so often in our history, our cattle trade, the way of all our old industries, Liverpool Ring, which jock-eyed the Galway Harbor Scheme, European conflagration, grain supplies through the narrow waters of the Channel, the pluterperfect interpretability of the Department of Agriculture, pardoned a classical illusion, Cassandra, by a woman who was no better than she should be, to come to the point of issue, I don't mince words, do I? Mr. Deasy asked as Stephen read on. Foot and mouth disease. Known as Cox preparation. Serum and virus. Percentage of salted horses. Rinderpest. Emperor's horses at Morstig, Lower Austria. Veterinary surgeon. Mr. Henry Blackwood Price. Courteous offer a fair trial. Dictates of common sense. All important question. In every sense of the word, take the bull by the horns. Thanking you the hospitality of your columns. I want that printed and read, Mr. Deasy said. You will see at the next outbreak they will put an embargo on Irish cattle. And it can be cured. It is cured. My cousin, Blackwood Price, writes to me. It is regularly treated and cured in Austria by cattle doctors there. They offer to come over here. I am trying to work up influence in the department. Now I am going to try publicity. I am surrounded by difficulties, by intrigues by backstairs influence by he raised his forefinger and beat the air oldly before his voice spoke mark my words mr dedalus he said england is in the hands of the jews in all the highest places her finance her press and they are signs of the nation's decay wherever they gather they eat up the nation's vital strength I have seen it coming these years. As sure as we are standing here, the Jew merchants are already at their work of destruction. Old England is dying. 
He steps swiftly off, his eyes coming to blue life as they pass the broad sunbeam. He faced about and back again, dying, he said again, if not dead by now. The harlot's cry from street to street shall weave old England's winding sheet. His eyes opened wide in vision, stared sternly across the sunbeam in which he halted. A merchant, Stephen said, is one who buys cheap and sells dear, Jew or Gentile, is he not? They sinned against the light, Mr. Deasy said gravely. And you can see the darkness in their eyes, and that is why they are wanderers on the earth to this day. On the steps of the Paris Stock Exchange, the gold-skinned men, quoting prices on their gemmed fingers, gabble of geese. They swarmed loud, uncouth about the temple, their heads thick plodding under maladroit skin hats. Not theirs, these clothes, this speech, these gestures. Their full, slow eyes belied the words, the gestures eager and unoffending but knew the rancors massed about them and knew their zeal was vain, vain patience to reap and hoard. Time surely would scatter all, a hoard heaped by the roadside, plundered and passing on. Their eyes knew their years of wandering and, patient, knew the dishonors of the flesh. Who is not? Stephen said. What do you mean? Mr. Deasy asked. He came forward a pace and stood by the table. His underjaw fell sideways, open, uncertainly. Is this old wisdom? He waits to hear from me. History, Stephen said, is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake. From the play field, the boys raised a shout, a whirring whistle, go! What if that nightmare gave you a back kick? The ways of the creator are not our ways, Mr. Deasy said. All human history moves towards one great goal, the manifestation of God. Stephen jerked his thumb toward the window, saying, That is God. Hooray! What? Mr. Deasy said. A shout in the street. Stephen answered, shrugging his shoulders. Mr. Deasy looked down and held for a while the wings of his nose tweaked between his fingers. Looking up again, he set them free. I'm happier than you are, he said. We have committed many errors and many sins. A woman brought sin into the world, or a woman who is no better than she should be, Helen, the runaway wife of Menelaus. Ten years, the Greeks made war on Troy. A faithless wife first brought the strangers to our shore here, McMara's wife and her layman, O'Rourke, prince of Burfine. A woman, too, brought Parnello. Many errors, many failures, but not the one sin. I am a struggler now, at the end of my days, but I will fight for the right till the end. Our ulcer will fight, and ulcer will be right. Stephen raised the sheets in his hand. Well, sir, he began. I foresee, Mr. Deasy said, that you will not remain here very long at this work. You were not born to be a teacher, I think. Perhaps I am wrong. A learner, rather, Stephen said. And here, what will you learn more? Mr. Deasy shook his head. Nose, he said, to learn one must be humble, but life is the great teacher. Stephen rustled the sheets again. As regards these, he began. Yes, Mr. Deasy said, you have two copies there, and if you can have them published at once. Telegraph, Irish, Homestead. I will try, Stephen said, and let you know tomorrow. I know two editors slightly. That will do. Mr. Deasy said briskly. I wrote last night to Mr. Field, MP. There's a meeting of the Cattle Traders Association today at the City Arms Hotel. I asked him to lay my letter before the meeting. You see if you can get it into your two papers. What are they? The Evening Telegraph. That will do, Mr. Deasy said. There is no time to lose. Now I have to answer that letter from my cousin. Good morning, sir, Stephen said, putting the sheets in his pocket. Thank you. Not at all. Mr. Deasy said as he searched the papers on his desk. I like to break a lance with you, old as I am. Good morning, sir, Mr. Stephen said again, bowing to his bent back. He went out by the open porch and down the gravel path under the trees, hearing the cries of voices and crack of sticks from the playfield, the lions couching on the pillars as he passed through the gate, toothless terrors. Still, I will help him in his fight. 
Mulligan will dub me a new name. The Bullock befriending bard. Mr. Daedalus! Running after me. No more letters, I hope. Just one moment. Yes, sir, Stephen said, turning back at the gate. Mr. Deasy halted, breathing hard and swallowing his breath. I just wanted to say, he said, Ireland, they say, has the honor of being the only country which never persecuted the Jews. Do you know that? No? And do you know why? He frowned sternly on the bright air. Why, sir? Stephen said, beginning to smile. Because she never let them in, Mr. Deasy said solemnly. A cough ball of laughter leapt from his throat, dragging it after after a rattling chain of phlegm. He turned back quickly, coughing, laughing, his lifted arms waving to the air. She never let them in, he cried again through his laughter as he stamped on gaitered feet over the gravel of the path. That's why. On his wise shoulders, through the checkerwork of leaves, the sun flung spangles, dancing coins. Happy Bloom's Day.